Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Great. I am super excited about uh, today's show. I am as well, and I think we're going to have plenty of content, so we're going to jump right in and welcome our guest. Um, our guest is an innovator. It's a name uh, known to, uh, I would say, most, if not all, hand surgeons, uh, and that is George Orbe. Welcome, Dr. Orbe. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Chris. It's glad to be here. Well, we're really happy to have you. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief uh, biographical background and feel free to emphasize or correct me if I don't get everything exactly right. Uh, Dr. Orbe was born in Cuba. Um, his medical school was done at the University of Puerto Rico. His residency was done at the Hospital for Joint Diseases in New York. And he was a hand fellow at Jackson Memorial uh, in Miami. Um, he's been in South Florida, I believe, his whole career and has, um, you know, done a lot of fascinating things with the development of implants and different ways of thinking about orthopedic pathology. Um, Dr. Orbe, I know you've had um, different people influence your career, but how briefly, tell us how you came to be an orthopedic surgeon. What was your pathway? I know engineering was an interest at one point, but how did you go from from a medical student um, to a resident at a wonderful place to having such an impactful career? Well, thank you for the last one. I always liked science. I always thought I was going to be a scientist, like a physicist or <clears throat> uh, something very basic and logical, but I ended up being a doctor which is a great profession. I, and the nice thing about being a doctor is that you are in contact with human beings. While had I followed my original pursuit of pure math, physics, and logic, I would probably have not enjoyed this aspect of life. So going to medicine was a great thing for me. And I really, when I went into medical school, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist because the human mind fascinated me. And I thought, well, <clears throat> I know it's very complex and there are many problems we don't understand, but maybe I can give a hand on this. But by the time I was a third year medical student, I realized this brain problem, nobody can solve and I'm not gonna be alone in this. So I decided, let me do something practical that gives good results and makes patients happy. So I'm not too sad. And that was orthopedics. And that was exactly up my Alley because engineering, physics, math, that was my thing. I was fortunate. I went to medical school in an obscure part of the planet, but it was actually quite a nice medical school. It was a beautiful thing to study medicine in a nice tropical island, make great friends, and it was an enjoyable ex experience. But of course, when you try to apply to a residency in the US, they thought you were crazy. But I cross path with Dr. Victor Frankel, who was the world's leading biomechanist at that time. And he hired me on the spot at Joint Diseases. He said, we want you to stay here with us. So I didn't even go through the match. It was very fortunate. And then the rest is, was hard work. You know, residencies are tough. That, and that, that Joint Diseases residency was tough. I did a fellowship with uh, Bill Burkhalter, who was the best a teacher I ever had. He was a true mentor. And then I was in private practice. I wanted to be an academician. It didn't pan out. And I was alone in private practice. For several years, all I did is work very hard, very hard, built a big, very successful practice, created a group. And one, one day I said, it's time to do it. Let's do it. Let's make the world a better place and solve problems that nobody has solved. <laughs> So in, interestingly enough, um, I have my three University of Miami degrees on the background here, uh, so, and I actually was a former patient of one of your groups. Uh, I had a fifth metacarpal fracture that one of your partners treated non-operatively, and no, I did not punch anybody, um, but uh, certainly I have heard your names throughout uh, the halls of Jackson Memorial and the University of Miami. Um, you're a legend down in South Florida, and uh, it's incredible that you went from one island to the next island, then to Manhattan, another island. Uh, it's a great story. And I know that your daughter, I believe, is an orthopedic surgeon too. So you clearly have influenced her in a very positive way. 
Thank you, Chris. Yes, uh, having my daughter become an orthopedic hand surgeon was a blessing, and I cannot have been such a bad dad. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, a, I have, I have two young kids. Chuck has older kids. And I think, uh, you know, it's certainly seeing how your, your daughter has progressed, uh, makes me, uh, uh, very aspirational and hopeful for my kids. Well said. Um, so George, one of the things I am most proud of, and Chris is going to roll his eyes and maybe laugh at me a little bit, but I, I have to my name, uh, a patent. Um, and really I say that quite quite uh, almost jokingly, because it's really my wife's patent, but uh, she started a business, a belt business. It's been, it's been great. But as I was preparing for this conversation, I, I searched uh, the patent registry for your name. And to say that I was overwhelmed would be, would be an understatement. So it's really remarkable. I didn't, I didn't count how many patents you have, but I was intrigued, especially by the first two. Um, and the first was uh, essentially, a, a, I believe, a metacarpal fixation process with a, with a way to um, position a K-wire and, and uh, put a K-wire. And I remember that, that, that product. And the second was your, um, essentially your volar plate with a uh, PEG device. Um, and so, so talk us through those a little bit. Why those two issues was it about an unsolved problem. Um, and I, I think all will be intrigued as, as to why and interested in, in, in just hearing more about one or both of those products. The metacarpal uh, flexible nail, um, it was something that I thought out when I was a fellow. So we see all these metacarpal fractures and we're putting plates on them. And I thought it was excessive surgery for such a silly problem because Dr. Burkhalter really wanted you to leave him alone. He said, put them in an MP block cast, hold the fingers down like this, tell them to move early. They might have a bump, but they'll have perfect hand function. And he's right. He's absolutely right. But patients don't like bumps in their hands. So I, at that time, there, there was a, this great surgeon, French surgeon, Guy Fouché, who had published that article on what he called the bouquet technique. Being French, he's an artist. So a bouquet is this long vase and you would put the flowers into it and the flowers would kind of go down and follow the neck of the vase. So that was his theory. You have, you get a metacarpal fracture and you put 3.45 K wires anterograde into the metacarpal and they'll do great fixation. And I thought that was a great idea. It worked very well, but it, it was kind of, you know, it was an operation. You had to make an incision, go down to the bone, drill holes, make a window, put the three K wires. So why can't we just do this percutaneously? And I started doing that as a fellow. You get a K wire, bend the tip, and then put it in a chuck, and then jiggle it down, make a percutaneous hole, jiggle it down through the metacarpal. And that really, it made sense. It really made the, the you still had to mobilize them in an MP block cast, but they didn't get the angulation. So, so that, that was the, that was the first, Pattern. So it was a way of percutaneously doing Guy Fouché's uh, uh, technique. Did, did that ever take off? Was that a success for you and for the Hand Innovations Company? Great question. Had that been the only product, we would certainly have uh, crashed and burned because it, didn't, it doesn't hold water. There was not enough revenue per case to be uh, commercially successful. But what did I know? I was just a doctor trying to solve problems. So I had that idea and I, I put a lot of effort into making it into a product. And we did have started this company called Hand Innovations. And that was our first product. But I also had this volar plate thing that I was developing at the same time. And it, it just happened, I got old enough that I said, I better do what I always wanted to do now. That was about 10 years after I had been, been in practice. So this is now or never. So the story with the volar plate is that that was a really big problem. So we were treating distal radius fractures with external fixators, which could you know, handle most of the deformity in extraticular fractures, but it was really very cumbersome and, and difficult for the patients and it produced a lot of stiffness. 
because those those pins going through the skin when people make a fist they, they hurt the skin pulls on them and of course people place them with too much distraction and so on and so forth jesse jupiter at that time came out with a pie plate that was his um uh solution to the wrist fracture it was a beautiful idea it was a, a pelvic recon plate made small and adapted to to the wrist there was a lot of interest at that time there was fragment specific fixation also taking off but when i used that pipe plate for the first time i said this is brilliant these screws they third into the plate not into the bone they give you a great fixation they just unfortunately are very irritating to the extensor tendons and on the same pipe plate said that um, Jesse, Jupiter, and Hill Hastings had developed, there was a, this little volar T plate that would accept this, this pins, this, they call them pegs, which is a great name for them. They screw into the plate and they simply serve as a buttress of the articular surface. So this volar T plate was designed for volar fractures and I used it for the dorsal fracture. I did, the first case was a, an older lady with a simple Collie's fracture, very displaced, she was very swollen, very miserable. And I just put this little plate on with a little local anesthesia, a little regional block. And the next time I saw her, she had like full finger motion, she had no pain, she was the happiest person ever. And I thought if I had put an external fixator on her, she would not like me as much. And I knew from the first patient I did with that Volatite plate, that this was the solution to the distal radius fracture. And we're talking about 1996, probably, at that time. That's how I came up with the volar plate. Then I put the volar plate and the flexible intermedullary nail together, and that was Hand Innovations. And Hand Innovations was a very successful company. Uh, I didn't know anything about business at that time. I was fortunate to have met uh, Ernie Hernandez, an engineer that had worked worked with Cordis Corporation, a cardiac company that had been bought out by Johnson & Johnson and closed and taking all the manufacturing down from Miami to Mexico. So he was out of a job and he started repping Arthrex. He came to my office one day and told me, uh, there's a good friend of, of, of yours that told me to talk to you. Do you have any ideas you want to develop? And I said, of course I do, but I have no idea how to do it. And I said, well, let's try it. We, we became partners in Hand Innovations. He put a lot of work and a lot of understanding of the market and understanding of product development. And I put all the money and all the ideas on, on how to solve the wrist fracture. And we were very successful. So, and Chris, I apologize. I don't wanna monopolize this, but I have a lot of questions. Um, and so <laughs> I'm gonna follow up with one and then I'll let Chris try to squeeze in a question here or there. So George, we met in either August of September of 2002. And I want the listeners to understand this because those who know Hand Innovations uh, from the past um, and certainly those who know your products uh, probably understand the hard work it took to build the company and get the plate right. But what you, the effort that you expended to make it successful and to have hand surgeons like me uh, adopt the technique is remarkable. So I started practice at Washington University in August of 2002. And shortly thereafter, a guy I did not know named Dr. Orbe said, hey, do you want to meet? And I'm like, at that point, of course, sure. I, you know, a, a nice hand surgeon. So I met you and you described your plate um, and you described the concept and I was sold. Um, because both uh, you're, you're personable and I, I, I thought the concept made a lot of sense and I hated external fixators. And so slowly I began to use the plate. And just so you're aware, my partners were a little taken aback. Um, and these are, you know, Richard Gelberman, Marty Boyer and others. Sorry. <laughs> well, I thought maybe my job would be short lived, but um, you know, eventually, like you, I shared the successes of this concept and eventually um, they bought into it as well. So as I imagine it, you crisscrossed the country, meeting no one, nobody's like me, um, sharing your idea and sharing the technology behind your idea. Right. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun too. In fact, I would not call it work. 
And it was just very enjoyable to meet other surgeons and, and to be able to share these ideas and, and to try to solve a problem that we all were facing. And there was, at that time, uh, a lot of people would throw eggs and tomatoes at my team. And it is true. But we knew we were right. So it wasn't difficult to keep on moving forward. So um, we have a lot of therapists, uh, hand therapists, physical therapists, and OTs that listen to the podcast um, and may or may not realize you know, what a game-changing innovation um, your product was and continues to be. You know, when did you change or what, when you first put in the bowler plate in that patient you described and then your subsequent patients, what was your rehab protocol? How did it change? I mean, one of the biggest advantages that I see uh, in my practice with, you know, a volar locking plate in a, uh, um, in this patient population is the ability to move towards early motion and earlier recovery. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, but the first case is we had to take um, more care of them because that volar T plate was so weak. It would break all the time. It didn't have a volar buttressing surface. So if it, it, it held the dorsal fractures well, but not having a volar surface, you would get that problem with a volar marginal fragment all the time. It, it was very serious. So we would put them in a cast, uh, on a short arm cast for four weeks religiously. Everybody got that cast. And I would do encourage them early motion. I'm not sure how clear I was with how much weight or force I would allow them to do. Uh, Uh, but I was very patient as the table. They, pro they Dr. were Dr. able to provide a uh, huh. I'm sorry. We just yes. lost you for maybe five seconds. Um, I'm not you were saying you were saying you weren't clear about how much weight you would let them put on it. Can you just start there again? And yes. our editor will edit that out. So at that time, we were not very sure of the rehabilitation protocol in the sense of how much activity or weight or force we would allow them to perform. We really had no idea. And we did have problems with failure of uh, fixation. We had particularly problems with a volar marginal fragment as those original plates did not have a, a, a good volar buttressing surface. So the pegs would hold the dorsal fragment, but there was not a good volar buttressing surface. As the, as the plates evolved and we understood the problem better, we corrected those problems. And that's when the term watershed line came in because we realized we must buttress the volar surface as far distal as we can. And the limit is the watershed line. Perfect, perfect. Um, what, what do you do with your, if you have a, just out of curiosity, if you have a relatively standard Collies type fracture and you elect to treat that patient with a volar plate, what do you do these days with your post-op? Do you splint them for a week and then have them see therapy? But just curious, what's your protocol? It's exactly that. The, I give them a post-operative dressing with the wrist in extension, a volar slap that holds the wrist in extension, but the finger is free. And I tell them, you have to start making a fist immediately. As soon as your hand wakes up from the block, start moving those fingers. And I tell them now that I trust the fixation and you can do activities of daily living. You can lift up to five pounds and I promise you fixation is not going to fail. The fracture is going to hold fine. It's like your bone is not broken anymore, but please don't move the sofa. I tell them. And then at four to six weeks when the bone heals, I let them do whatever they want to do. And it, Right now, loss of fixation after distal uh, uh, volar plating is extremely unusual. So, What was it like seeing your product, your baby, go to the masses and seeing everybody putting this plate in and then seeing subsequently the issues that, uh, that may develop with tendon irritation either on the flexor side or the extensor side because everybody's putting it in. They may or may not be following your technique. And they're maybe using slightly different products. Um, what was that process like for you to, to see that happen? Uh, you, uh, you, hit, you, you hit the nail right on the head. 
every time I see a complication from a volar plate, I think it's my fault. I, I feel miserable about it. I feel miserable about flexors and then ruptures. I, I feel miserable about you know loss of fixation with volar marginal fragments. I think the, the main problem is if you don't get an anatomical reduction, the plates are designed for an anatomical reduction. So if you don't get an anatomical reduction, the plate is sticking up in space and the flexor tendons are right on the surface of the plate. And many of these fractures come to the doctors, say 10 days or two weeks after a close reduction, and they collapse, or they just took time to get to a, a, the surgeon from the initial uh, treatment, uh, treating physician. By that time, if you just do a simple volar approach and try to pull as hard as you can, you won't be able to reduce the fracture because there's a hematoma on the dorsal side that is now organized and the periosteum is intact. So you can't really get the length back, can't get the volar tilt. It's impossible to reduce the fracture. And that's why we have problems with flexures and ruptures um, to this day. So the proper technique is the breeding the hematoma. And for that, they have to pronate the proximal fragment out of the way, which is my extended FCR approach. That is, I think, my biggest contribution, more than the plate, is the approach. But people think it's too aggressive, and they don't want to do it, and they end up struggling. Do you release the brachioradialis in every volar approach um, for a distal radius fracture? Great question. You don't have to in every case, because in some cases you can actually pronate the proximal fragment without releasing the brachioradialis. It's just easier to. Uh, the, the important thing is, is to debris the hematoma to uh, allow the, the, fra the dorsal fragment to get down to its uh, anatomical reduction. But in young patients that come in relatively early, I won't release the brachioradialis. I will just the radius, aspirate, curette, irrigate the hematoma out, and supinate it back into place. And then the anatomic reduction comes in automatically. Now, I think there are a lot of surgeons that will use this fixed angle device to, you know, to help get the reduction. Now, does that technique ever have a place in your, um, in your toolbox, or are you very adamant? It sounds, sounds like you are about getting an anatomical reduction before you apply the plate. Yes, I, uh, I am very uh, insistent on getting anatomic reduction, but I do understand that in some cases it's very difficult. And those would be the nascent malunions. You have a patient that is six weeks down the line, is already some early bone formation on the dorsal aspect, and you pronate the proximal fragment, you deprete the hematoma, you excise the dorsal periosteum to try to eliminate all the soft tissue restraints to regaining the length. And still, it's very difficult to get the reduction because everything is contracted. The fascial planes, even the muscles and, and the skin might be contracted at that time. So there is a place for the distal fragment first technique. You apply the plate to the distal fragment and then you lever the plate down to the radius. That helps you get the volar tilt. But when it's that tight, it's very difficult to get the length. So it's not only regaining the forward tilt, it's also regaining the length, with, which we do with a bone holding clamp and using that first screw that we put into the oblong hole, then you, you, you use a clamp as, as a mechanical um, uh, advantage tool, like a lever to push the proximal part of the plate up. And it's not trivial, it, it's really difficult to do. And you need a good assistant to go and drill your hole and put your screw when you have it down to length. But I, I think like 99% of the time, you can always get the reduction and the, and the length. So I have one more technical question about uh, how you approach these fractures before we move on. Did you, when you started, repair the pronator quadratus and did you change and what do you do now? I still repair the pronator quadratus. I, I don't think you have to repair it for any other better reason that that is where God placed the muscle and put it back where it belongs. I mean, I cannot demonstrate that the patients get a better result when I repair it, but I think 
it's it's just the right thing. As a surgeon, if we restore the anatomy the best we can, we're doing what's best for our patients. And do you have any technical pearls in terms of how you either elevate the pronator quadratus to facilitate the repair later on or, or how you do the repair itself? Oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> So one very important thing is when you do the breaker that is released, don't cut it just across, but do a step cut anatomy so you can repair it side to side with a mattress suture. When you repair the, the, break, the um, breaker of the alice side to side, now you have somebody to suture your pronator to. You can suture the pronator to bone, and if you don't mobilize the flexor carpi radialis, it, it will not bow string. And you know, release the tension and the sutures will rip up from the pronator. But if you have released the brachial dialysis from the distal part of the radius, got a step cut and you can repair it kind of loose. As you repair the pronator, there's not enough tension on the sutures to rupture your pronator off. And the other point is distally, when we elevate the soft tissues from the watershed line, the first centimeter or so is not muscle. It's that thick periosteum that we call the transitional fiber zone. So that tissue is very strong. So you can always put it back exactly where it belongs. And then that will cover the distal edge of the plate, which is where the tendon ruptures occur. So I think you get the, the biggest bang uh, for your buck by repairing the transitional fiber zone. And then the repairing the muscle is a great thing to do if you can. That's Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. So um, we mentioned your first uh, company was Hand Innovations and your, I believe your second, and I don't know if it's your last or there's other companies down the road, uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> is uh, Skeletal Dynamics. And uh, you have a number of products. Um, I have two questions regarding your products for Skeletal Dynamics. The first is your Volar Plate. Um, do you think we've pretty much gotten to the point where the Volar Plate is... Uh, there are a number of options out there. Yours is beautiful. Uh, are there more advances to be made with the technology for the Volar plate or are we pretty good? And then the second thing I do want to touch on is your elbow internal stabilizer, but I'd love just to hear your thoughts on the future of the Volar plate um, first. Thank you. So on, on the Volar plate, I think that current paradigm has been developed uh, to a point in which there's still room for improvement, but we're pretty much uh, far into it. And I don't think you can make a volar plate much better. One thing you could do is come out with a way of allowing the surgeon to apply the plate to a mal reduced fracture and then reduce it correctly. Some sort of levering device for the surgeon that doesn't want to do the extended MCR approach. We, we could do that. I just don't think it's the best way. It's not necessary. It's not the best way to do it. People do learn how to do the operation well. Teaching is the most important thing. If I can get to the surgeons and, and teach them the technique, then they all should get just wonderful results with the currently available plates. <clears throat> there, there's also place for uh, improving the hook plates, the plates that are designed for the volar rim fractures. Interestingly, volar plates were introduced uh, to treat of dorsal fractures because we thought we had the volar fractures are, uh, you know, covered with volar buttress plates. The reality is that nowadays, the more difficult fractures to fix are still the volar fractures that are comminuted um, because the plate has to be pretty distal to obtain enough uh, buttressing, and then you cross the watershed line. That's why we now are banking on the hook plates. The hook plates are an extension that cross the watershed line, but they try to minimize the irritation to the flexor tendon. And there's a place for a radial sided hook plate. There's no volar marginal fragment on the radial side, but sometimes the, the uh, scaphoid fossa requires more fixation that can, we, that can be provided by, by dorsal buttress pegs. So to have some sort of uh, buttressing, a plane that, is, uh, that creates a concavity underneath the, the uh, subchondral bone of the scaphoid fossa, 
uh, would be of benefit for some of these volar, volar community unstable fractures. So we can still improve volar plates a little bit, but there might be other solutions to the volar fracture that still have not been developed properly. And, and a minimally invasive form of fixing extraticular fractures, which are so common in the elderly, um, a, a, a frail patient, uh, would, would come in very handy. As something that can be done through a very small incision in very little time, and at least stabilize 50% of the distal radius fractures, which, which are completely extraticular. I, I think there is room for that. Makes sense. Makes sense. So talk to us um, again, you, you saw another clearly unsolved problem, uh, also a problem that the external fixer had a, a outsized role in caring for, and that was the you know, unstable elbow injury. And uh, many of our listeners, I, I would guess, are not familiar with the internal joint stabilizer that you've created. Can you just talk us through identifying the problem, how you thought about solving it, and then what things look like today? Right. Uh, that's one of my favorite things, that internal joint stabilizer is, is one of my passions. So the unstable able has been a problem for a long time. We, uh, we tried the uh, hinged fixators. It seemed like a great idea, but it proved to be impractical because it, they were very difficult to apply. And it was very difficult to reproduce that axis of all no humeral rotation. So it didn't, didn't really work. And the pins going through the scale so the skin, just like in the external fixator, they inhibit motion because they hurt when the patients move the elbow. So it, it was pretty obvious that the next thing to do was develop a small uh, fixator that would be internal, not to irritate the, the skin, but yet provide the stability. necessary to treat these and that's sorry, how, sorry uh, we, it was in around 2000 and yeah we lost you again for a second yeah. you, you were just getting to start uh talking about i don't know i guess the you you mentioned the negatives of the external fixator if you can just start over we just lost you for a sec so after after seeing all the difficulties with the hinged uh, external fixators we realized there was place to develop something simpler and better tolerated by our patients. But it, it really is just an internal external fixator. The original hinge fixator was designed by Mori and it had an access pin. It was a Steinman pin that was drilled through the elbow. It came up through the skin and was attached to this fixator on the ulna and on the humerus. So it, it really was not that a innovation. <laughs> it was just, a very small fixator uh, under the skin, but it it really was uh, a step forward for the elbow uh, uh, surgeons. What was interesting about this product was once we had realized what we need is a very small fixator under the skin, how can we guide the surgeon to always get that true axis of ulnar humeral rotation. Because if you don't get it right, the elbow doesn't really move. It will, it will uh, as you flex, it might distract or it might uh, uh, compress the articular surface and you won't get the motion that you want. And that was the most difficult intellectual challenge in the internal joint stabilizer story. It was how could we do this? And we experimented with several different techniques, some of which, which would be quite amusing. So one required pins on the ulna, pins on the humerus, and some gizmo that would self-align as you flex and extend the elbow, and then you would drill the K-wire through the gizmo, and it would reproduce the axis. That would work, but it was so cumbersome, it, it made no sense. And one day, it just dawned upon me, why don't we just give him a guide that centers on the medial trochlea. So it, as you center the medial trochlea, you have one point on your axis of rotation, and then just look at the lateral aspect of the elbow, find the center of curvature of the capitellum, 
market and drill the K-wire through both points. And that's the, the guide on the internal joint stabilizer. That, that was the most fun part of the whole project. And how do you, so this is a rare problem uh, and clearly you can test it in the lab, um, but how long did it take you to be convinced that you would hit on a solution? Not long. <laughs> <laughs> Me either, <laughs> it was, it's great. So there was an article we published in around 2014 on, um, I believe it, it, it was a, it, it, it was a, uh, what magazine was that? Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research. And it, it was about the use of a bent Steinman pin as an internal joint stabilizer. So the, the, the first 50 or so cases that we did were actually bent Steinman pins. I would get a Steinman pin, a 2.5 millimeter Steinman pin, and then bend one eight, um, sorry, one end into a figure of eight. We would do this, I would do this in my garage. It's very, very, very simple. Just bend it, some pliers, something to bend around it and cut it. And then I would have that figure of eight, which was the plate, and then the long rest of the Steinman pin. So in surgery, we would find the axis of rotation, 2.5 millimeter drill, and then cut the stamen pin to length and bend it until it, it worked, until it, it, it fit that particular patient. Uh, use two 3.5 millimeter AO screws to fix the figure of eight down to the ulna, and, th and that worked. So when <clears throat> we already had a significant experience with the Ben Steinman pin before it was a commercial product. So in my mind, there was no question that the commercial product would work. It would just make this accessible to all the surgeons that are not necessarily willing to bend a Steinman pin the way I was. You know, it took a lot of work. I can, I can just imagine you and your garage and your pliers and uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. So, you know, this has been a ton of fun. Um, and I think very inspirational to many and uh, some great technical pearls. But for those surgeons and or therapists who have ideas, do you have any general advice about how to pursue their ideas and, and how to go, you know, where to start really? Yes, I do. Uh, I think follow your passion. If, if you think your idea is worth it, give it 100%. Many times the first step is actually to protect it uh, with a patent. And this is something I didn't know, and I learned it by experience. I could have obtained a very broad patent on voter fixation of dorsal fractures, but I didn't because I had no idea. And I just did the cases and presented it in a meeting, and then I, I completely obliterated my chance of getting a patent on that concept, but that's fine. You know, I cannot complain about anything. So do protect the idea. It takes some money, about 10 or 15 grand to, to do so, but, it, but it's worth it. And after that, then you have two choices. You either develop the product with a company, and that is probably the most common way of developing ideas, or do it yourself. I, I chose the doing it myself. Because I was very bad dealing with big companies. and didn't have the skills to do that and it worked for me, I might not be the solution for everybody. Uh, so <clears throat> I think the best advice is give it 100% and trust yourself and, and you'll succeed. I think that is, a, that is a great way to end this uh, interview. George, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining us. I, I really do mean it when I say that uh, you are uh, an inspiration to many of us and you really, we all aspire to obviously help our own patients, but to have a bigger impact and your impact has been immense and continues to be immense. I don't want to make it past tense. So thank you for what you've done for the field of hand surgery and wrist surgery and elbow surgery and uh, really remarkable. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, th those words uh, really inspire me to continue forward. Thank you. And thanks, uh, uh, Chris. I, for joining I really us. Appreciate. We're looking forward to seeing what's next for you. Uh, we're always excited. Uh, so thanks again for your time tonight. Thank you.